better. It, it helps you create a more mature threat model. And, and so I would take your problem with that. You've got to have a threat model now. Okay, but let's be honest. Business has to happen, and you have to get past your checkbox at some point. But you can also be proactive with it and continue to keep that, that model. That way, when they come with a new feature, you're not stuck in that same spot again. You don't have to start from the ground up. You've already got something you've, you've started building, and you can see how things might affect one another. Yeah? I meant both because or a lot of organizations don't really have a formalized SDL, um, but almost every organization has a release cycle. Uh, I like to think that they're basically two terms of the same thing and SDL is a little bit more fleshed out, uh, a little bit more formal of a process. A lot of times it has more steps that have to go through because you have a more dedicated architecture phase. Or, or whatnot, and, and a more dedicated testing and QA phase. But a lot of release cycles already have, a, okay, we built the product, then it goes to QA, then we have to release, and then you have to maintain. So there, I meant both. Yeah? If you could only choose one um, place in an SDL to coincide a threat model, uh, would you choose architecture or QA? Like an architectural review or a QA? I, I would have to pick the architecture review portion, um, especially as you introduce new features, because key, it's if you do find flaws, it's easier to remove them. Because let's be honest, in threat modeling, it's design flaws, it's not implementation flaws for the most part. So I, if I had to pick one point at which that was my only touch point, I would pick architecture over QA. So let's say that you did a threat model like the beginning. No, I'll use the one that I've got, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll make modifications to it. Um, again, I talk about this later, but it's great to do it in this, in this fashion. Uh, a threat model should never be, uh, where I said it was a living document, that means you keep maintaining it and re you, re you version control. You put it under version control, put it in your source code repository or something so that you can see how that it's changed over life if you need to. And who do you, who do you think should uh, be part of creating a threat model? Anybody that asks what if. It is not a single person job, it's a team job. And, and you, need, you need to, the most effective threat models have an aspect of business, they have an aspect of architecture, they have an aspect of developer, they have an aspect of testing and QA. That's at a minimum. You need those different perspectives because they will all look at your project from a different uh, from a different angle and, and want different things out of it. So the single guy doing a threat model, and that's, I know how it ends up being because I've done several of them myself, it's a starting point. It really needs to be, in my opinion, more people involved than just one. I prefer to see most of the players in the team project being, uh, having input into the threat modeling process. When you talk about one person threat modeling, are you talking about the threat model? So you have to have a starting point, right? Okay. And that would be your threat modeler if you have to single one out. But making additions or modifications to a threat model, again, starts with what if, happens a lot of times when you get a group of people talking about, well, what if this happens? Well, we have this in place. And it's just a matter of recording those, the, uh, the, the, the outputs of those sessions and, and incorporate, and the th where I said a threat model can be the story of your project, that's one of the places where you can add a chapter, so to speak. Mm -hmm. A wiki'd be fine. A living yeah, a wiki'd be fine. Yeah. Uh, this actually brings a whole other topic that uh, with a complex enough system, uh, your threat model runs out of date really quickly, mm -hmm. and it's just another uh, document, if you will, that needs to be QA. Right? It needs to be up to date. Otherwise, it's another checklist that uh, it's not reflective of your system at all. Right? So if you have a wiki thing which is constantly changing, at which point, uh, how do you go checking? 
Well, that's one of the nice things about wikis, though, is a lot of times they version the documents and you can go pull up an old version. Yeah, it depends on how formal you want to be. It, it depends, depends exact, exactly, yeah. We wouldn't care about stuff like that. We'd just be happy to have something at all. Yeah, no, uh, the big thing is getting something down. I think that's the big thing. Oh, I, I like the idea of doing it in a wiki because it's a very dynamic and a living type of a document. And then if you do need to print it out, it's like, okay, well, PDF it, right? Um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think I like the idea of doing it in a wiki better than a word document. Okay, uh, let's see, we'll jump into this. Uh, so, there's also the we've talked about when a, a when to uh, when to start a threat model and how to maintain one, but there's also an aspect where you might want to not do one anymore. Uh, maybe your project's gone end of life. And, and that's one place where you can stop. Or in some organizations, especially on internal tools, it's just we don't care anymore. I still don't recommend getting rid of it at that point because those we don't care tools tend to be relied upon for a long, long time, especially in very, very large organizations. And then you end up with somebody that, oh, I don't know who maintains that. We just use it. It's worked for years. Uh, and, and then you could be able to pull this up and see, and, and if there was a problem, you could see if there were um, issues. Uh, that you could p have somebody else pick up and take ownership of it a little bit more easily. Uh, yeah. When the project is dead of life, are you talking about set -set application? Yeah. If you're not going to make any more modifications to it and you're taking it off the mark, your project off the market or out of production or whatever, you may not need to, I mean, you're abandoning the whole project, right? Uh -huh. Essentially at that point, well, then you don't need to threat model. The idea is that you, while the project is alive, you should you should attempt to maintain your threat model. But as long as the project is still in existence, you mentioned actually two scenarios. Since that application simply means no more modification, to mm -hmm. my definition, my personal definition means that I'm not making any more modification, but the application continues to be in operation, which simply means that you still have risks, which means if that application, as application being used, you have more users and you, have, you continue to have data, you still have more risks. Would that not be a case when you continue to monitor the system? Is that called continuous monitoring? You could. So that that's, I guess, a little bit different between sunset and end of life. Well, end of life simply means you are going to turn off the application, take it off um, operational <coughs> or production mode. That's, that's really a real termination that you're talking about disposal of end of end of Okay, that's what you're talking about. And, and nothing I say here is set in stone either. So, I mean, it, it's going to vary between, based on, we talked about speaking the same language. This is another one of those places where the language might not be this. We may be meaning different things for the same words. So, I, if you're still, if that gets back to when you don't care anymore, you obviously still care if you've sunsetted your project and it's still out in production and you have risks that you need to keep, keep on top of it. So, you're still caring about your project and I would recommend absolutely keeping your threat model going if you identify new risks to the application. We covered participation a little bit in a question. This is a the the list of the high levels of the ones that I like to see always participating in a threat model. The top one, I think, is maybe the most important one uh, because a lot of times they've already gone through in their head a lot of the what ifs, how is this going to affect, they've, they've come up with what this is supposed to be doing. Um, and then, of course, the project owner is, should always be a part of it because they're guiding where the project is going. Architects have a different insight. Sometimes some of these people are the same people, too. but. Uh, this is the big one. Anybody that says what if on a pro that's part of a project or even maybe outside it might be your customers do a what if that you didn't think of before, that input should still be able to go into your threat model. Yeah? Um, I think one category that we miss often, and I think it's a critical category, is your implementation. Mm -hmm. Because it's really easy to say what if, and then you have to go back and if you don't understand how your team is 
through the implementation, you may not catch some of those. I absolutely agree with you. Yes? I think that goes towards what she was saying about implementation teams. And then I didn't include, um, let's see, who else? No, I think I got it. Those are the ones that I meant to hit anyway. Um, anybody else got any ideas? We've got the infrastructure team that I didn't hit, that I didn't have on this slide, which I'll have in the next version. And <laughs> um, any, anybody else that you can think of that might need to uh, have input into uh, a threat model? It could, yes. It, it does, yes. What about business analysis? Sure. Absolutely. And your, maybe it's your audit and compliance teams, as, as what the previous talk up here was talking about, or, or maybe, maybe, maybe it's a manager level position of some sort. I mean, your, your project managers, sometimes they do more than just de deal with Gantt charts. Um, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I, when I was making this slide, I was thinking of just the project team, but a, a, in a lot of SDLs now, you have your security champion as part of your organization. They, they would absolutely be in this process as well. Yeah. What your uh, support team, if you've got those teams for people that maintain your product, is the customer facing the product? They're, they're going to be mostly involved after release, but that's still an effective time. They're, they're yep. I mentioned that you, I mentioned your your customers having input if they, if they come up that would be more where that comes out I think most of the time but not always because they're also going to run into some of those situations that they might what if based that's not quite what the customer said but based on something that they've had to deal with correct and and that doesn't really change whether it's an internal project or an external project you had a question yeah um how do you focus, I mean, this is a diverse group of people. Yes, it is. A lot of these people, um, a lot of these people, we even talk about the idea of some of them don't have security uh, uh, practice or understand security practice. Right? Uh -huh. But when we do threat modeling with a large team of, of people in my organization, uh, we often have the threat model really surrounds the project itself and the threat to the project, but not the threat to the application as an ecosystem. Um, and that becomes that's a, a different so, threat model. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, and that's, that becomes a problem because it seems to be overloaded because everyone's got the project on their mind. Mm -hmm. And they think, well, what if we don't get the servers in time? What if we don't get the hardware in place? What if we the user acceptance testing fails? What if, and there's all this stuff, right? So, so it's always, so it's always I, I get that very much, and I've been in those situations. Sure. Um, for your actual application, those would all be, you know, external dependencies or whatever, right? Um, but it's important to recognize, somebody needs to recognize that you're straight off and you're not actually doing what this work is, you're doing this work over here. Not, both of those pieces of work may be entirely valid. And in fact, with project management, they do a lot of the, yeah. of the, of the, the timing of servers or deliveries or whatever. That, that happens a fair bit, but it's, it's, it's a different model and I think it's important to be able to recognize that, but it's also a gut check. Right, it, it, you gotta have to have somebody actually realizing that you straight off. So th it's a risk, and it's not one I have a very good solution to right now. Yeah. So, so it might be the the, 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 the person leading the threat modeling um, exercise might want to just keep everyone on track about yes. the threat model being an application wide threat model, and I guess there's no really easy way to explain what that is to those people that are sort of mired in the project. Right. Well, you, you, you did a lot of that just going towards saying you're, not, you're worried about the project, not the application. And, and by pointing that out, you, you, you are recognizing that. that so I, I, it's good to be able to be able to point that out. And I, I think even just mentioning that will put a lot of people back on track. And, and maybe it's another meeting that has to be scheduled because we all love those, right? <laughs> And we've talked about this a little bit on how to